All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Seth. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I get to teach this morning. Just a little recap of where we've been and where we're going. We started off the year teaching through the book of Genesis, and we're still doing that. We started off in Genesis 1, and we did the creation story, and we looked at that really uh, a little bit verse by verse, a little bit subject by subject as we were examining uh, how the, the first section of the Bible helps us understand the structure of reality, and especially as it relates to uh, controversial issues. Then we jumped into the rebellion story, which is Genesis 3 through 11, how that is both a record and a warning about uh, an explanation helping us understand how did the world get this way, but also uh, a warning about our tendency to reenact those stories of rebellion, both as individuals, as households, and as societies. And now we're moving post-Easter into the, the longer part of the book, Genesis 12 through 50, which is a story of promise, that God promises to be a blessing to the world through the descendants of Abraham. And we're going to hear the story about how that unfolds and where it goes. This story today uh, is Genesis 12 through 14. It's three and a half-ish stories, but it's really one story, and it's a story that I, I've titled the sermon, Altars in the Wilderness, or Building Our Altars in the Wilderness, because it's really a, a, a between story. It is a wilderness story. The wilderness is a space in between developments, right? There's a city, wilderness, another city. Wilderness, are, they're hostile to human flourishing, they, they feel unsustainable. I can't live here forever. It's, it's tents, not houses. It's between. It's journey. A lot of the times we think about our lives in terms of destinations, but the majority of our life is actually a process of journeys that are linked together. So we inhabit wilderness space all the time in one way or another. And this wilderness space is really a story about between promise and fulfillment space. Genesis 12, God promises to Abraham, I will bless you, but then it's not till Genesis 14 that Abraham is blessed. And so in between promise of blessing and blessing is where this story plays out. And on the one hand, the entirety of the Christian life is an in-between story. Jesus saves us and promises to make all things new, and we are living in between the promise of blessing, and the fulfillment of that blessing. And on the other hand, our lives are marked by tons of little wilderness journeys in between jobs, in between children, in between spaces, in between churches, emotional journeys, relational journeys, that there's this in-between space that we have to walk through and inhabit where we're not where we want to be. We think we're on the way to where we want to be, but there's this unfulfillment, this out-of-reach hope, and our season ends up being marked by various disappointments. And so we're going to look at this wilderness story, this in-between story, but then also this is a complicated person story. Abraham, the blessed one, the man of faith, the one who when God says go, he listens and he goes. What a, what a courageous, faithful man, but it does not take long for him to really stink. He's cowardly. His instincts are worldly. The way that he thinks is not really formed fully by Jesus at all in a lot of ways. Sometimes he responds to adversity with faith. Sometimes he responds to adversity faithlessly. Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Should we, do we want to be like Abraham? Do we not want to be like Abraham? He's a complicated person. And so we're going to identify with him because we're all that way too. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to go through this story and we're going to try to see what the Lord has for us this morning. Let me pray. Jesus, I ask that you will, uh, by your spirit, uh, filter through our, uh, our defenses and help us, our heart be impacted. I pray that we would see the way that you work in Abraham's life and in this uh, story and help us be similarly impacted and corrected by this text. Amen. So the sermon title again is Altars in the Wilderness because the, the organizing structure, like the anchors of this text, are Abraham interacting with 
altar. So I'm going to summarize the plot and then we'll go to some lessons that we can uh, be implicated by in this text. So Genesis 12, we did in the scripture reading, says, So Abraham went as the Lord told him. He told him to leave, Abraham goes. So he takes his wife Sarai and all, these, all the people who are with him and they go to Sechem, the Oak of Morah, and they see that there's Canaanites all in the land. Whoops, I thought I was going to get the blessing here. Turns out, already occupied. And then says the Lord speaks to him and says, to your offspring I'll give this land. Now Abraham's like, hold on a minute. Am I being blessed or is my offspring being blessed? Do I get to see this or is it offspring? And there's kind of this moment here. But then Abraham receives what the Lord says and it says, so, uh, starting in verse 7, so he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now an altar is a space that's expensive to build. You kill an animal on it, you offer a sacrifice, and you pray. That's what an altar is for. It's a dedicated place where you sacrifice and you pray. And so Abraham builds an altar to the Lord. This is an act of faith. It takes faith and investment to build an altar to the Lord. He goes, I've heard from the Lord. I'm going to build an altar. I'm going to pray. I'm going to offer sacrifice. I'm going to pray. This is an anchor for him. And what you think might happen is, all right, Abraham coughs it up, puts down the altar, and he prays, and then the Lord is going to give Abraham what he wants, right? That's how it goes. You pray, then you get what you want. You, you offer to the Lord, you get what you want. You go abracadabra, you get what you want. No, that's not what happens. Immediately after building this altar, he's like, all right, I'm going to be patient on the Lord. And Abraham journeys on. Now, it says in verse 10, now there's a famine in the land. Bummer. I prayed, offered sacrifice, came to the Lord. Things got worse. What's this deal here? I thought this was like, a, I scratch your back, you scratch my thing, Lord. And the Lord who is doing is he's pushing back on that. That's actually not how this works. This is difficult because we want to trust God on the basis of believing he'll do what we want him to do. But almost all the time, that's not how it works. We have to trust the Lord on the basis of his absolute over history, author of history, sovereignty. There's a famine in the land. So now Abraham has a test. This is his first test. How's he respond to this test? So Abraham went down to Egypt. Not great. Trusting the Lord's promise, trusting the Lord's blessing, trusting the Lord's provision. As soon as the going gets tough, what's he do? He goes, to the regime. He goes to the, the big government. And so this is not like I'm out of food in the pantry, go to the grocery store, famine in the land, going to hit up CVS or whatever. Uh, he goes, famine in the land, he's going to Egypt, which from where he's going is like basically going from uh, Queen Creek to East Texas with camels and donkeys on foot. This is a long journey to try to get that he has this unfulfillment he's beginning to suffer he's getting a little hungry the rubber's meeting the road and his instinct is where do you actually trust and he trusts Egypt Egypt we talk about how uh, in every culture the big three idols tend to be money power and sex Egypt is the apex of this in the ancient world they are famine proof that's how good their storehouses are they got tons of money they are the military industrial complex before there was one. The world superpower. They are the palace of pleasure. And the Pharaoh has lots of women. What does Abraham have? He's got one woman. And so what does Abraham do when he's hungry? His instinct is run to Egypt. He does not go back to the altar. He does not run to the Lord in prayer. He does not go back to the land of his fathers. His instinct is things are tough. Run to Egypt. And what does he do when he gets to Egypt? He goes to his wife. says, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this must be his wife. Then they'll kill me. Say you are my sister, verse 13 says, that it may go well with me because of you. And that my life may be spared because of you. So the Egyptians see his wife and that she's very beautiful. 
And the princes will go to Pharaoh. They go, hey, Pharaoh, this new lady wandering through. You're going to want to see her. It's this guy's sister, so she's fair game. They praise the beauty of Pharaoh. And the woman is taken into Pharaoh's house. Makes her a wife. I'm not sure how everyone defines toxic masculinity. But being a huge coward and pipping out your wife, it's on that list. Hey, I'm going to leverage my wife's beauty for the sake of personal safety. I'm going to leverage my wife's compliance so that I can be in good standing with the powers. I'm going to make use of my wife and I'm going to get money from it. Now Abraham, this works for him. He plays the game of the world system. He plays the game. He does the sex money power thing. He gives over his wife, checks one of those three, and in return he gets power and money. Verse 16, and for her sake, he did go, it did go well with Abram. He got sheep, oxen, donkeys, servants, camels. The Lord must approve of my actions because my bank account's going up and to the right. He's probably okay with my sexual morality because if he wasn't, why would I be getting all these camels? Clearly, the Lord is okay with my strategies because he's Seems like he's endorsing them because I'm getting wealthier. No, the Lord afflicts Pharaoh with great plagues. Pharaoh calls Abraham says, what have you done? What's the deal here? Why would you say she's my sister? He says, get out of here and go. Pharaoh seems to be like he fears God more than Abraham does. Abraham leaves. Abraham swings and misses major on this test. This is what things we have to understand is a lot of the times we sin in order to alleviate suffering. That does not make it not sin. But I was hungry. But I was tired. But it's been a long week. But there's famine in the land. Run to Egypt. Sex, money, power. Abraham the father of faith, blessed to be a blessing. Coward. Then, so Abraham went up from there, him and his wife, chapter 13, and all that he had, and his nephew with him. What a weird moment for Abraham's wife. She's been probably in Pharaoh's house for a couple years. Abraham's off in the land, making money, doing his thing. Pharaoh says, none of this anymore. Get out of here. Pharaoh has to take his wife's hand. Sorry, honey. You know, Sarah doesn't have a voice in this story. In Moses' recording of it, probably because she didn't have a voice when it happened. Chapter 13, verse 2. Now Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. He's going back. Between Bethel and Ai. To the place where he had made an altar at first. Bethel and Ai. Bethel uh, means house of God or house of the Lord. And Ai means like place of destruction. He's back in this in-between space. Back in the wilderness. In between destruction and the house of God. A place that we live a lot of our lives. And you imagine Abraham's walking through the desert after weeks of coming back up from Egypt. And they see something over to the side. A landmark. Looks familiar. That's the altar I made. That's the place where I once offered sacrifices to the Lord. That's the place. And so there's like this remnant 
of, of faith that he reminds. I, I remember what I used to believe. I remember what I used to think. I remember what, what was there, that my, my, my real faith that I had, it's still there and it's rekindled. I've, I've kind of run to Egypt, but now the Lord has brought me back to this place of going, oh, that altar. And Abraham sees the altar. And there Abraham calls on the name of the Lord again. He comes back. It'd be, it would have been easy for Abraham to say like, I'm avoiding that altar because that is, I'm an Egypt guy now. I'm not an altar guy anymore. But he goes back to the altar and he calls on the name of the Lord and then everything goes well for him. Nope, that's not what happens. Abraham gets so rich, all this money that he desperately wanted. I'm going to go to Egypt, get money. That's going to solve my problems. He gets all this money. But then what happens? His wealth was so great that they could not dwell together, it says in verse 6. And there was strife between Abraham's tribe and Lot's tribe, his nephew. He prays at the altar, and now it's not going well for Lot. Abraham takes matters in his hands. He doesn't go back to the altar and pray again. He doesn't run to Egypt this time, but he just kind of tries to solve his own problems. He's like, let there be no strife between you and me, between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. And he says, let's just go our separate ways. Meaning, I don't really want to solve this problem. I'm going to avoid this problem. Let's not just say, hey, let's work through this. He goes, no, we just need boundaries, a.k.a. I'm going to avoid this problem and just going to go our own separate ways. And so Lot, Abraham goes to Lot, says, which one do you want, this side or that side? Lot goes, I'll take that side. Lot looks to the side, and over there is Sodom and Gomorrah and beautiful land and fertile land. It's well watered. And Abraham, kind of an honorable moment, says, okay, if that's what you want, you go that way. I'm going to go this way. And they go their separate ways. Verse 12 says, Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities to the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. A little foreshadowing for a couple of chapters ahead of time. So Abraham is a coward in chapter 12 and it results in his wife being in Pharaoh's house and then he can't resolve this conflict. He avoids the conflict and that results in his nephew being in Sodom and Gomorrah. Not looking great for Abraham. Now you imagine at some point the Lord's going to show up and say, Abraham, get it together. Or he's going to say, you know what, Abraham? Swing and a miss twice. Never mind. I'll bless the world through somebody else. Getting sick of you. But no. The Lord shows up in the midst of his nephew being in, in Sodom and his wife having just kind of got out of Pharaoh's house. Here's what it says in chapter 13, 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, you're like, oh, here we go. This is going to be straight across the teeth for Abraham. He says, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are. North, south, east, west, all land you see, I'll give to you and your offspring forever. I'll make your offspring as the dust of the earth, that if one can count the dust of the earth, which you can't, parentheses there, your offspring can also be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. This is the reminder for us as God's people, that God promising to bless is not contingent upon us being awesome. It's not how it works. He doesn't say, Abraham, I'll bless you if you're better than Pharaoh. doesn't say, Abraham, I'll bless you if you're unlike the Canaanites. He doesn't say, Abraham, I'll bless you if you do good business deals. He doesn't say, I'll bless you if you don't struggle with sin anymore. He says, I will bless you. It's contingent upon God's character, not contingent upon faith, Abraham's faith or faithfulness. That is how grace works. That's what makes us go crazy because we realize that I am not earning or adding value, but yet God blesses and he works through. That is grace. You don't pay it back. You don't earn it. It's bestowed. And you respond with gratitude. It is wild that after the Egypt story and the Lot story, God shows up and just reminds Abraham, hey, I'm still going to do what I said I was going to do. And sometimes it's hard for us to receive the promise and blessing of the Lord because we're going, I feel so insanely unworthy that it feels awkward. And guess what? It is. And you're insanely unworthy. But yet God blesses 
sinners and mixed bag faith people like you and me. Then it says, Abraham builds another altar at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Finally, with God's reaffirmation of blessing, finally with Abraham seemingly kind of learning his lesson and taking steps, now things are going to go well for Abraham. No, they don't. Now a great world war breaks out. And the kings of Mesopotamia, from Elisar, from Elam, this is chapter 14, of Goyim, these kings made war with the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Abma, and Zeboim, and Bela, that is Zor. This is like World War Zero in Mesopotamia, about to go down, and where Lot's, where Abram's nephew is, Lot, is waging war against these other people from uh, ancient Mesopotamia, and Abram's kind of down here in Canaan, a little bit out of the, the battle zone. And now Abraham has this test. You can run back to Egypt, go tap into that money and power, go and say, I'll, I'll give you my wife again, sorry. What's he going to do? But this time, Abraham isn't a huge coward. This time, he isn't a faithless, spineless person. This time, he gets together this kind of like Jewish Navy SEALs thing, and they go and Wreck shop. So it, so it says this. So someone came and tells Abram, say, hey, this goes on. It says, when Abram heard of this, kin his kinsman had been taken captive, his nephew. He led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and they went in pursuit. This time, instead of running to Egypt, looking for solutions, Abraham is able to see with gratitude what God has already given him, and the solution is in his house. Sometimes we think that God hasn't given us what we need, to solve the problems in front of us, and you need to acknowledge God has already given you what you need to acknowledge to, to solve the problem that's right in front of you. Stop looking outside and look at how God has already provided through what's inside. Abraham sees his kinsmen taken captive, takes 318 of them, and he wrecks these foreign kings, and he brings back all the possessions, including the kinsmen and their possessions and the women and the people. So he prays, famine, he prays, family strife, he prays, world war. You can imagine Abraham's like, maybe I should just stop praying. Every time I make an altar, something goes bad. Sometimes we stop praying because that's how we feel. I keep praying to the Lord, stuff keeps going bad. Might as well stop. What's the point of praying? Stop building altars in this wilderness, because guess what? Still in the wilderness. But part of what Abraham's story is teaching us is that we don't pray simply to get what we want from God. That's just manipulation. That's magic. Manipulating the deity through saying magic words. But we ultimately pray to show honor to the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, we pray to be changed by the maker of heaven and earth, the owner of heaven and earth, the possessor of heaven and earth. We pray because we know God listens and he cares, but he's also not tossed to and fro by our human desires. And so Abraham seems like he learns this lesson. He doesn't run to Egypt. But then also there's this thing like at the very end where after he slaughters these kings then the king of Sodom comes out and is going to try to show Abraham like honor in verse 21 it says um, give me the persons but take the goods for yourself meaning the people that you freed from the evil kings we love those people back thank you but all of the wealth that you've stolen back why don't you just keep it like as a thank you let me make you rich let me make you wealthy and Abraham says this but Abraham said to the king of Sodom I've lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I've made Abraham rich. He kind of learned his lesson because Pharaoh, through Egypt, has a bit of the right to say, I made Abraham rich. And he clearly seems that he's been doing some work. Maybe his wife is getting at him, maybe the Spirit's getting at him through prayer, that he's going, I'm not going to repeat that mistake and get wealthy by partnering with evil. And I'm not going to be associated with these evil world systems because it benefits me financially. 
Because Pharaoh could say, I made Abraham rich, but he's going, Sodom is not going to be able to say that, so he gives everything back to Sodom. And so there's like this lesson. He kind of goes from total coward in the Egypt story to now he's interacting with these people, and he's courageous, and he also has some honor, and he's like, I'm not doing that. And so, so what do we learn? Here's, here's, that's, that's how the story sort of wraps, but here's what we learn. Number one, and very significantly for us, is best case scenario, you will, we will, live a very, or leave a very mixed legacy. Abraham, the man of faith. Obviously, hugely mixed legacy. This is like, I think, harder for people in the first half of their life to swallow because you think, I'm going to go to therapy and pray and then I'm not going to sin against my kids. And guess what? No. Those of you in the second half of life, you know this. The list of regrets is long and it's getting longer. And living with the guilt of the mixed legacy, the things you taught your kids you wish you didn't teach them, the things you modeled for your children you wish you didn't model for them, the things your coworkers learned about God from you that was unholy or profane. One of the best things you can do if you're a young person is pre-decide or at least get on board with the fact that you will leave a mixed legacy and you're going to have to pre-decide that you will own it you will name it, you will confess it, you will own the pain created by it, and you will not spin it, but you will repent of it. Those of you who already have that list growing, you know your mixed legacy. Sometimes we're tempted to feel like, I don't really need to apologize for those things because they know that it was wrong and they know that I feel bad about it. I tell you what, They probably know it was wrong, but they maybe don't know that you know. One of the more helpful spiritual tools we're given by the Lord is confess your sins to one another. Dads who confess their sins to their kids, you can teach your kids the creeds all day long, but if you can't confess your sins to your kids, They're not going to follow you in the faith. It's hard to eat crow, to name it, to repent of it, to do the work to repent of it, to to humble yourself to the next generation, your kids, your grandkids, your coworkers, your neighbors, all these people. But that's like square one Christian faithfulness. A lot of times what separates Christians from non-Christians is not how moral we are, but how often we repent and that we do repent. Abraham's the man of faith and he stinks. So I promise you, you stink too. Just get on board with having to repent all the time. The sooner you just do that. And it's not like this shameful, whip yourself, I guess I'm no good, I should just die. That's not the point. God is blessing a sinful people all the time. That's all he has the people he has to work with. That's the only option he's got. You'll leave a mixed legacy. Call your balls, balls. Call your strikes, strikes. That's all it is. Uh, Number two, in between promise and fulfillment, we suffer, we act, and we pray. That's the whole Christian task. We don't do nothing. We do something. You know, Abraham takes a lot of swings. Sometimes he strikes out. Sometimes he gets on base. Sometimes we can't totally tell if it was a strikeout or a base hit. But he's doing stuff. Waiting on the Lord is not being passive. Waiting on the Lord is suffering, praying, and acting. And waiting. But we suffer. This is how it goes. Abraham prays and things go bad and he responds. That's the deal. That's how this goes. We tend to pray, suffer, and respond. That's how this works. We suffer, we act, we pray, we pray, we suffer, we act, we suffer, we pray, we act. This is, these are our three plays. If you think that you're gonna follow the Lord and just be up into the right forever, then you've been following the Lord for like 35 seconds. Abraham's story is way more like our stories than we want it to be. My hope is that we would acknowledge the ways that we are like Abraham. Going gets tough. Run to Egypt. Sex, money, power. 
Money's gonna solve my problem. Power's gonna solve my problem. Sex will solve my problem. We wanna build an altar. Number three is in the wilderness we build altars. But the most important altar is one we cannot make for ourselves. So if building an altar is coming to the Lord and praying, the most important altar is the one that we cannot make for ourselves. You know, I'm coaching four to six-year-old basketball, which is wilderness, you know, so got a bunch of four-year-olds on my team. And there's five, and so I'm watching, we're warming up, four-year-olds are shooting. You know, I'm like, wilderness, here we go, you know, so. But then this kid shows up. He's six and three quarters years old. He's on his fifth season and he's shooting free throws. I'm like, we're good to go. We blew him out, you know. Winners win as the kids are learning. So we're one and oh. Sorry, now we're winners. But it's going, I was not going to coach these four-year-olds to a win. It was not going to happen. But I inherited something. And this is the the picture we get here of Abraham. As he's building altars, he's praying, he's suffering, he's acting, he's working. And out of the blue, this person shows up named Melchizedek. And he brings bread and wine. Here's what it says. Chapter 14, verse 18. After the return from the slaughter of the kings, verse 18 says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was God of Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High. This is the fulfillment of the blessing. Abraham is not yet blessed by God, but then Melchizedek shows up, and now the fulfillment of the blessing happens through Melchizedek. Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Where did this guy come from? He was not in the story up to this point, and he's not in the story after this point. He shows up, seemingly out of nowhere, and I'm going to get a little Hebrew nerdy on euphoria, and some of you are going to like it, and some of you will tolerate it, but we'll be okay. So chapter 14, verse 18 says, and Melchizedek, king of Salem. So a little Hebrew lesson, the way you say king in Hebrew is Melech. The way you say righteousness in Hebrew is Kizedek. His name is Mel- Melech Kizedek. So he's the king of righteousness, Melech Kizedek, king of Salem. So in Hebrew, that's Melech Shalom. So the word, so Hebrew does not have vowels. You have to supply the vowels. It's all consonants. So Salem, S-L-M, is the same as S-L-M, Shalom. Salem, Shalom. So he's the king of righteousness, the king of peace. And he brings out bread and wine, priest of God most high. And he blesses him. Priests bless people at altars. This altar Abraham didn't make. He didn't really search for but Melchizedek shows up, bread and wine, and blesses him. That theologians uh, talk about this guy and speculate about this guy. They're like, where did he come from? Where did he go? The book of Hebrews talks about how he's like, kind of like, doesn't have a father, doesn't have a mother, shows up, drops out of nowhere. Uh, and so they reference this guy as maybe a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. Like before Jesus takes on flesh, Uh, He seems to appear in the Old Testament a couple of different times, and maybe this is an appearance of Jesus. And the author of Hebrews talks about Melchizedek, and he's not really mentioned anywhere else in the whole Bible. This is Hebrews 6. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. What a picture. That the winds and waves are being smashed around, and there's this anchor holding you fast. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, the place where only the high priest could go, the Holy of Holies, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. In the Holy of Holies, there they'd offer sacrifices for sin, and Jesus goes on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him. Where is the altar at this church? If we're trying to do altars in the wilderness, where is the altar? This is not an altar. It's a table that holds my Bible. This stage is certainly not an altar. This is just a pragmatic necessity in a room this big. You kind of have to get people up so everyone can see them. The only altar that exists is represented here by the cross that's hanging over my head. This is the ultimate altar. The one final sacrifice for sin where Christ offers himself. And it's symbolized to us in bread and wine. 
It's the communion table. That is the altar. The picture of the cross. The death and resurrection of Jesus. The one final sacrifice for sin. The altar we most needed that we could not build for ourselves. And this Abraham story resolves that the ultimate blessing of the man of faith is rooted in the king of righteousness, the king of peace, who brings bread and wine. And so in our wilderness of our lives, the most important thing we can do, songs and sermons are good, but the Spirit meeting us in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is the altar for us in the wilderness. This is why we take communion every week. Because at this altar is where we're reminded of our faith. Reminded of who we truly are. Reminded of how we became who we truly are. Reminded of the fact that our sins have been paid for, period, the end. That in the mixed legacies that we leave, it's not by re-upping, trying harder, doing better next time that we are saved, but it's in the blood of Jesus that we are saved. And so, we pray and we metaphorically build altars as we, we pray in the midst of seasons of transition and wilderness. But the non-metaphorical altar of the crucifixion of Jesus is the most important altar and the one we can't make for ourselves. And so whatever season you're in, whatever you're going through, whatever angst you have, whatever in-between liminal situation you find yourselves in, the most important thing you can do is meet Christ at the Lord's table and say thank you. So let me pray. God, this Abraham story in the wilderness, uh, we resonate with it on a big picture scale and many of us in a very acute way. God, I ask that you will help us find you in this uh, various forms of wilderness, but most chiefly that we will meet with you in the altar you've provided, the altar that you built, and the altar that you purchased uh, in this communion table. Lord, calm all our hearts and help us connect with you. Amen. Uh-huh.